of the responsiveness to specific inflammatory mediators, the degree of responsiveness, and the other is a reversal of the effects of mediators. So this type of control is very common in uh, autonomic nervous system. Sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons tend to work using this strategy, they reverse each other's effects. And in the, uh, in the context of the response of target tissues to inflammatory, me inflammatory mediators, we can also find examples uh, uh, of uh, uh, regulation by reversal of the effect of inflammatory mediators. And this type of control is almost completely studied in this context. But the advantage uh, of these different controls is that, uh, of, of this way you're looking at them, is that controls at different levels have very different uh, purpose and mechanisms. Regulation at the level of sensors is, tends, tends, tends to be, tends to be uh, signal specific. Because the way that these controls work is by inducible expression of negative regulators or signaling pathways. So if it's a particular type of inducer activates particular types of receptors, these are the receptors and their signaling pathways that will be inhibited at this stage. This control is very different. It tends to be gene-specific. All the major anti-inflammatory mediators like ALTAN, corticoids, and so on, they work in this manner. And they don't block, they don't shut off the immune response. They block certain components of the immune response, something that will get back to and what they do, uh, they shut down something like 10 to 15 percent of, for example, of uh, genes induced during the inflammatory response, induced by, uh, by the sensor. A control of the level of target tissues is uh, specific to a particular response, to a particular type of inflammatory mediators, whether it's uh, inflammatory cytokines, TNF, or cell protein, and, uh, and the reversal of the effect is presumably also tissue specific. So the advantage of having this type of a control is that um, it allows to uncouple the cost that is paid by the target tissues uh, uh, from the benefit of what is the intended purpose of the response. So if we take a simple, simplest possible example of a bacterial infection, and let's say TNF production is important to defend against that bacterial infection, but TNF will have effect on, um, on target tissues that can lead to immunopathology. So you limit TNF production because it's constrained by the cost. The way that that cost can, that, that trade-off can be deconstrained is by making tissues less responsive to TNF. Of course, if you make all the tissues less responsive, you might as well reduce the amount of TNF. That's where the trick is, that you don't make all the tissues equally responsive. Different target tissues differ in the degree of their vulnerability to inflammatory damage. So if, they, if you take, for example, uh, uh, keratinocytes in the skin versus hypothalamus, and expose both of them to the same degree of an inflammatory mediator, the consequences would be dramatically different. So what the way that this uh, trade-off is deconstrained by making target tissues that are most vulnerable to the attack of a given level of inflammatory mediator less responsive. In this way, the system can tolerate high level of TNF necessary for successful defense and at the same time minimize the cost associated with negative effects of inflammation. Put it more generally, I'd like to think of uh, uh, host tissues uh, as forming a spectrum in terms of their vulnerability to immunopathology. Again, if you take every possible host tissue or organ, you can imagine that on the spectrum, on the left side of the spectrum, the tissues that are most tolerant to damage on the other end of the spectrum would be tissues that have, have highest vulnerability to that. And that could be, for example, uh, because on this side of the spectrum would be tissues made up of dispensable cells that can be easily renewed. The loss of these cells doesn't have immediate health consequences. 
and uh, this has to do with tissues that are renewable with, with a high rate. For example, you can lose transiently all your uh, neutrophils or eosinophils, you're not going to die from that. But if you lose even a few percent of some other cell types, that would be lethal. So that's what I mean by dispensable and renewable. Damage to skin or epithelium can be quickly repaired. Damage to heart cannot be renewed. And that's what forms this, two, this, this type of a spectrum. And what I'm suggesting is that there is a, this correlates with the spectrum of tissue responsiveness to functional mediators. That on this side of the spectrum would be tissues that uh, will have the highest responsiveness and during an ongoing immune response, these are the ones that will continue to respond versus the ones that on the other end of the spectrum that have the lowest responsiveness. At least the ones that will shut off their responsiveness first. And then the extreme of this spectrum would be what's known as immune privilege sites. These are the sites, tissues in the body that are shielded from the immune inflammatory response altogether because of the, presumably, of the highest one that would be made by the organism if these tissues are affected by inflammation. So blood-brain barrier, eyes, uh, uh, genital tissues, they're all protected uh, from immune inflammatory response, presumably for that reason, because of the highest one that would be made otherwise. So the second aspect of regulatory strategy as it relates to deconstraining trade-offs has to do with a particular uh, uh, feature of regulation of the inflammatory response that has to do with uh, component-specific control. So again, I'll illustrate with a simple example of uh, the major, most robust inflammatory response that's known can be used by microbial products when they activate macrophages. And if something like LPS uh, uh, activates macrophages, that leads to induction of uh, several hundreds of genes. But these genes can fall into multiple categories. These include classical inflammatory cytokines, inflammatory mediators, chemotactic uh, factors, that also includes coagulation factors, antimicrobial genes, genes involved in recognition, phagocytosis, and gene processing presentation, tissue repair, and metabolic regulators, and a whole bunch of other genes that are always uh, uh, seen on various uh, gene expression analysis, but their functions are less well understood. But the point is that these form distinct functional categories. And this inflammatory response, therefore, is multi-component, has multiple components. And the point is that each component has different interests and costs. So something like inflammatory cytokines and chemokines that recruit neutrophils will have the highest cost. And something that uh, has to do with <coughs> function of receptors for phagocytosis probably will have the very low cost. So the point is that when the inflammatory response is controlled, uh, the way that controls, control mechanisms generally work is not by shutting off the response altogether, but shutting off the responses in the order of the intrinsic costs. And to illustrate this example, I uh, will show you uh, uh, this is a very old, very well known phenomenon called LPS tolerance in macrophages. When macrophages are activated with LPS or other TLA ligands, that leads to transient unresponsiveness. So, this is production of IL 6 when macrophages are stimulated. Uh, and then re-stimulate it again. After about 24 hours, they completely lose responsiveness and it lasts for about a day or two, and then they regain it. But this type of uh, unresponsiveness is, has always been measured in terms of production of inflammatory mediators, which is only one of the components of the TLA in this response. And we thought that it wouldn't make sense to shut off this response completely because lack of production of antimicrobial effectors in the presence of LPS and therefore in the presence of infection would be presumably not a good thing. So a much better strategy would be to shut off the types of responses that have the highest potential for tissue damage, like cytokines, prostaglandins, and so forth. Because they, in fact, first of all, they're not necessary to continue to be present during the course of infection because, again, their effects outlast their presence. Whereas antimicrobial effectors, they don't act on cross tissues, they act directly on, on the pathogen, and 
that in fact don't outlast their friends. They need to be there for as long as there is an infection. So we tested that uh, by looking at expression of, for example, inflammatory cytokine like IL-6 versus, and there you see that single stimulation leads to uh, strong induction of this gene, but continuous stimulation leads to shut off of this gene. And that's in contrast to expression of antimicrobial gene, single stimulation leads to, again, strong induction, but continuous stimulation leads to even stronger induction. The reason being that you need this gene for as long as the macrophages can sense LPS, because that means there is an infection. And second, you probably need more of it if, because continuous presence of LPS means that the problem is not being solved by whatever was produced initially. So in a way, that, uh, uh, that's sort of one, one example of uh, uh, quote unquote uh, uh, priming or memory response uh, at the level of macrophages. More generally, all the different components of inflammatory response can be broken into two categories. Uh, here they call them inflammatory mediators and antimicrobial genes, but more generally, genes that you don't want to be continuously induced because of the high cost, because of the potential for tissue damage, versus genes that you need to be present for as long as, the, as there is a stimulus. And these genes tend to be the ones that can cause tissue damage, this include inflammatory cytokines, body patterns, and so forth. And these are antimicrobial genes that have direct effect on pathogens but don't affect host tissues. And the overlapping areas would be genes that are, both, that are antimicrobial but can cause tissue damage. For example, uh, nutrient oxides in the case of uh, genes involving production, they have oxygen genes and so on. These can, uh, uh, can affect host and they, therefore they also regulate in a way uh, as uh, the other cause of and, and this also correlates with the way that immune response is uh, controlled by anti-inflammatory signals. I mentioned that anti-inflammatory mediators like AL-10, TJ beta group corticoids, they don't shut off the response for the same reason. They only shut off genes that have the highest cost of tissue damage, but not the genes that you need to be continuously present. And just a couple of examples, couple of examples. this is this group of corticoids. On top, there are genes in the first category, inflammatory mediators, they are inhibited by uh, good corticoid analog, dexamethasone. Genes involved in antimicrobial defense, they are not upregulated, they are not inhibited in anything. In, this, in the case of the gallon, they are actually synergistically activated by uh, good corticoid. The second example is IL-10, it's a major anti-inflammatory cytokine. Here on the left, you can see that it inhibits inflammatory genes. Uh, but it doesn't inhibit uh, uh, it doesn't inhibit genes involved. This is arranged to be. So these are inflammatory, this is inflammatory, and this is antimicrobial. And it doesn't inhibit antimicrobial genes. Again, for the same reason that uh, that type of component-specific control allows for um, allows to deconstrain the cost, the deconstrain this trade-off between the intended function of inflammatory mediators and the consequence of their uh, uh, on the post tissue. And the second uh, uh, part of the second example of the constraining has to do with uh, post distribution and post association hierarchy of the response. And what I mean by that is that uh, uh, just like in the case of the inflammatory response, there are different components of the inflammatory response that have.